I'm acquainted with Brother Hills over one of the lists. And you may say, well, that's strange. Well, not really, because on the list we're on, the Internet list, and I think it would either be contending FTF or CFTF or both, that there's all sorts of things discussed. And it doesn't really take that long to see where a person's coming from, how well they can reason, their ability to use the scriptures, and their knowledge of what's going on in the brotherhood and the way they deal with things. And uh, came down and talked to the Greens and found out he had uh, preached to them 19 years ago. I take it from what was said. You all haven't seen one another hardly at all. In <laughs> so uh, anyway, we, we, it's good to know all these brethren that we haven't known over the years, personally I'm speaking now, who are loving the truth and standing for it. And we hope we can find out many, many more of them. Brother Hill is Carl E., you know, Eugene, I suppose. You didn't want me to say that, did you? Gene Hill. He was born in 1950 in New Richmond, Ohio, brought up in Kettering, Ohio, Ohio a suburb of Dayton. He's a graduate of Fairmont East High School, 69, a U.S. Navy veteran. He served from 1970 to March 1974. He's married to uh, Jerry Y. Booker. And I think that's Germain, and I get that right. Um, in 19, August of 1974, I noticed he just put August 74. Probably couldn't remember the date. <laughs> 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 they have one son, Justin, who has made himself well known in a very good way on these lists and the argumentation and ability. And uh, he was born in 1979. He's a graduate of Faulkner University with an AA degree in 99 and Free Harbor University 04 with a BA in business. He's married to former Shannon Pennington, living in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, Justin and Shannon are expecting their first son in May of this year. And I know some grandparents will be looking forward to that. Gene attended the Florida School of Preaching from 76 to 78 and B.C. Carr was the school director. He has preached in uh, Florida twice, in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Louisiana, and currently preaching for the Indianola Church in Indianola, Mississippi, which he's been there just a few months. And very grateful to have him come and speak to us on a timely subject. Always will be money and unity. I learned, I've learned a number of things today, and one of them is don't call Brian on the telephone. <laughs> uh, common sense and better judgment <laughs> ought to come into play more than just a little bit. I appreciate this opportunity to be here. Um, it, it is definitely an honor to be amongst folks such as yourselves, to finally meet the men that you've known for years and have never had a chance to meet, and, and to put names and faces together. Um, I, I've heard of Brother Oxendine over the years. Uh, he's a good example of, of finally being, I just didn't think he'd be as tall as he was. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate the things talk. <laughs> what? <laughs> appreciate the, I appreciate this, 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 this series of lessons on unity. It's absolutely crucial. Something that was, that's been said, uh, and it's, it's hard not to talk about what you've heard already today, but talking about unity, one thing we need to understand about unity is our faith as those that love the Lord, our, uh, the, the Bible is our, it's two things, it is our rule of faith. Uh, first, first John chapter 1, 6 through 8. It, it, it guides us, it tell us, tells us how to walk. But what people don't understand is it is also the, the limit of our faith. Second John chapter 9, uh, Second John verses 9 through 10, we cannot go beyond that which is written and what the written word means. We cannot do that and be faithful to God. And brethren, listen to, listen to these tapes. Listen to what's been said. It is a great example, of a bad example, if you will, of what the problem is, is people have gone beyond that which is written and are doing what they want to do. And it gets back to money. Follow the money. Follow the money. By the way, Brother Watson said, he said, I understand unity, but I just want some of that money. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been the, assigned the topic of money and unity, and of course the, the obvious text for unity would be Ephesians chapter 4, the first six verses. But money, Webster defines money as 
It is any token or other object that functions as a medium of exchange that is socially and legally accepted in payment for goods and services and a settlement of debts. Money is also, also serves as a standard of value for measuring the relative worth of different goods and services as they store, uh, relative worth of goods and services as a store value. And some authors explicitly require money to be a standard of, of deferred payment. Uh, you know, you need money. We need money. Society needs money. There's no question we need some, some uh, vessel to, to show value that we can have an exchange. Now, as already talked about, uh, unity has been defined already. Uh, uh, Brother Jack did an excellent job a few moments ago, but it is the quality, uh, again, uh, Webster says, is a, the quality or state of not being multiple, of oneness. It is a condition of harmony, that is, accord, continuity without deviation or change as in purpose of action, the quality or state of being made one, unification, that we are all together on the same page. Now, as part of the introductory part, I, I want to talk just briefly about God's sole right of proprietorship. And I have to tell you, that's not original with me, but I couldn't tell you where I got it from. Um, uh, plagiarism is taking one idea and making it your own. Research is taking a bunch of it. This is research. <laughs> and what that means for this topic, by reason of creation, everything belongs to God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, God is, is self-existent. As the self-existent, he created all that he is. He's, I believe Brother Warren is the one that defined it as, the, as the, fir, uh, the uncaused first cause, beyond which you can't get any further back. As a consequence, he owns it all. It's his. Everything here, lock, stock, and barrel, is his. The psalmist says, I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Now what's left out of that? Well, there isn't anything left out of it. It's all his. And, and we need to re recognize that and treat it accordingly. Again, the Psalms 100, he says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The Ecclesiastes writer says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. I'm not my own. I don't belong to me. I can't use myself in any way that I want to. I, have, I am only authorized. Now, I can do what I want to do, but I'm not authorized to do it. Unless it's in harmony with the will of God in the first place, who gave me to myself. He said, Gene, here you are. Let's see what you're going to do with yourself. And that's just about what it amounts to. Having created man in his own image, God is the father of the human race. Again, going back to Psalms 103 and Ecclesiastes 12 and 7 and all these other verses. But man serves in a stewardship capacity over creation, including his own soul and spirit. Again, God, it goes back to the idea that God gave me my soul and spirit. I just am not allowed to do what I want with myself as well as all that man creates or, drain, or, or gains a property interest in. Uh, I don't want to get into politics, but your politics is just simply an expression of your religion. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and 21, Neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Watch, it's his. It is his. He owns it. He is responsible for it. Now, if you think you own something, try to sell it. If you think you own your house, try to do whatever you want to do with your house. If you think you own your restaurant in some states, try to sell trans fat. <laughs> try to sell it. You can't. It's illegal. Try to smoke it. I'm glad you can't smoke in a lot of places. I think it's disgusting, but it's a, it's a human right to decide, I guess a human right, decide what you want to do, and, and we're not going to get the Nazis involved with this, but that's about what it comes down to. It's just unadulterated fascism. But this means that God has the authority, the power, and the right to establish rules and regulations in keeping with his holy being. And it's my privilege to follow that, to listen to what he has to say and do it in his way. Notice that God is omniscient. There isn't anything knowable that's subject to knowledge that he's not that he doesn't that he doesn't know about. Uh, in uh, 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 in Job chapter thirty-seven sixteen, dost thou know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? 
Psalms 104, verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are thy works, and wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. It is his. Why do we argue about what we're going to do with it? Just find out what the master wants us to do and then just get on about his business. His knowledge of human history is perfect. He knows all that, is, that has happened, is happening, and what will take place yet in the future. And that's a scary thought when you think about it. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. You cannot hide from him. He knows all that has happened and will take place. God is omnipotent. Job says, I know that thou canst do all things and that no purpose of thine can be restrained. And somebody's thinking, well, can he pick up a, a weight that is too heavy to be picked up? He could do everything that is subject to power. Well, can he make a, a, a ball that is black and white all over at the same time? It's not subject to power. It's not even worth talking about. And people get into silly things like that, and we just know that. If you be on those lists for any length of time, you see silliness gone to seed. <laughs> but his, um, his omnipresence, his, his being being everywhere, if you will, kind of at the same time, uh, he's everywhere. He does, there isn't anything that he doesn't see that he's not aware of. Furthermore, Jehovah God is eternal and unchangeable. Aren't you glad for that? That there is something that lasts, that something that doesn't change. How do you get through life? How do you get through life? Well, what do you believe in? I'll tell you how you get through life. And I'll tell you if you'll be successful with it or not. By believing in something that is eternal and the last. And I'm encouraged to see the young people here, and I really appreciate that. Amen. Now, that the homeschooling, God bless mothers when you do that. I think our, I think our son, the grandson, is going to be homeschooled, and I'm glad for that. But since God has delegated to man the task of dominion over the material realm, man consequently is allowed to explore, develop, and maintain this treasure. And we have been given a great blessing. Observe the natural wealth that has been mentioned in Genesis chapter. Just go through that list and just read the things that are there. I read an account years ago, years ago that when the, the area that we now call Michigan was being developed, that you could literally go there and literally pick up iron ore off the ground. Now, I don't know. I, I just read that in passing. It's one of those things you, that's, that's amazing that sticks in the back of your mind and it, and it bubbles up and it did. And, and you just walk around and pick up a rock off the ground and lo and behold, it's iron ore. Now, I can't imagine that. But that just goes to show you the richness in the Delta where we're now living, the Mississippi Delta where we're now living. It's just, you could just fire a rifle shot and not hit anything. It's just that flat and just that prosperous. God gave us that. God gave us the opportunity to maintain it, and it's our responsibility to treat it correctly. Now, uh, we, we, must, uh, we must not leave out the fact that man began to abuse God's blessing in short order. Now, uh, Cain slew Abel in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. Don't know how he did it. Did he pick up a rock? Did he pick up a tree limb? I don't know. Whatever he used, he abused. Aside from the fact he murdered his brother, whatever he used, he used out of authority for its use. And he sinned in the process. And he murdered his brother in the process. And he suffered the consequences of his abuses. Now, let's talk about money in general. Now, the first apparent mention of wealth in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham and Sarah uh, were in Egypt and uh, due to the famine and uh, given the circumstances that of Abraham's deceit re regarding Sarah's wife, Pharaoh seems to have given gifts to Abraham as he sent him away. Uh, Abraham profited, uh, or Abraham rather, uh, profited inappropriately. Um, in, in connection with that uh, is a consequent description of, Abraham, of Abraham's wealth. Uh, in which he deemed he was deemed very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he got that through his own industry and, and, and trading and doing the things that folks that deal with that kind of stuff do. An early contemplation of financial transactions in which m the word money is actually used is in Genesis 17, 13, and he that is bought with thy money, indicating that they recognize, there was a recognized process of ac economic activity. Something somewhere will finally settle in for money. I, I read, a, again, one of those things that sticks in your mind over the years, in one of the South Pacific Sea Islands, one of the native tribes uses, or used at one time, they found the artifact, a, a huge stone wheel that was the size of a truck. I mean, it was just that big. And that, the, the caption of the picture said, one of the coins. It didn't succeed because it took two men a boy to get it in the slot of the Coke machine. It didn't work. It didn't work. You know, so obviously, it fell out of favor real quick, you know, and walk around with one of those back straps on, I suppose. But, uh, 
but we, uh, in, in, in verse 15 of, of, of Genesis 23, the term uh, shekels was used uh, for the first time being a standard of weight used to measure out silver and gold as well as, well as other commodities. You'd go to the money changer and they used a shekel. And so whatever came out the other side was a shekel. It's like a dollar. A dollar is, is not really a, a value of money. It's a denomination. It just simply tells us what it represents. And that's what a shekel originally was, as I understand it. Uh, in our own nation, until Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury under President George Washington, devised our own national banking system, we are a nation limited in our ability to progress. Go back and read the history. And it'll tell you, you'll find out until Hamilton came along and organized the thing over a bunch of, object, uh, I think, some pro appropriate objections from some other people, we weren't going anywhere. And we were going there quickly. And we weren't going to get very much in the process. Uh, from a financial perspective, until a way is devised to conveniently, ethically, and morally convey value, a society as a rule does not progress. And, you know, we've still got money woes today. And last, and last, and until one possesses a standard of value and worth, all is, with, is, is without value or worth. However, when a standard is discovered and maintained, all objects and ser services acquire value and worth. You know, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we partake of the, 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 the fruit of the vine, do you realize how much value that little cup of juice places on your soul? Jesus shed his blood to purchase you from the, from the kingdom of darkness, from the power of darkness. That establishes value. If I am that valuable, why don't I treat myself better? My wife will tell you I treat myself pretty good. But why don't I treat myself spiritually better? Why do some of our brethren treat themselves and each other the way we do? They have not accepted the, uh, the, the standard of value that the bank of heaven has placed on my soul. And when we start getting back to that, maybe we'll just be a little bit kinder to each other. Now, the work of the kingdom, and here's how this starts to apply. The work of the kingdom is put forward at a more rapid pace with the aid of financial means. It, and brethren get upset when preachers start talking about the need for money. Brethren, we need money to make the... We, we couldn't be here without money. Or we wouldn't all be here at the same time without money. To get here four days, we wouldn't have lights and air conditioning and, and the things we have without money. We need money. The destitute are taken care of. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and, 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 uh, and, and 45, all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. It wasn't a communist society. It was theirs. They sold it when a need arose and they considered it as somebody else's because they needed it. They gave what they needed out of the goodness of their own heart. Widows and orphans have their needs met. James 1.27, A pure religion is undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the followers, the widows, and their affliction, and to keep him himself unspotted from the world. Now here's a question I have for some of our brethren. Why is it that a congregation cannot, in their view, cannot practice pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father? When we take money out of the church treasury to help those that are in need. Well, you can't do that. Oh, yes, we can. Watch the treasury. He'll write one for you if you're in, in need. And they say, well, you can't use church money out of the church treasury to support an orphan. You can't buy groceries for the, for the non-member. Oh, really? Where do they get that from? Show me where in the Bible that it's, it's here we're supposed to do it. Now, I got, had a phone conversation a number of years ago when we first moved down to to Lakeland, Florida, uh, to Auburndale, Florida, the old Orange Street congregation, a uh, 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 brother by the name of Frank Jamerson from over in, in Lakeland called me up, and he was of the persuasion, said, you can't use the church treasure for stuff like that. And he says, uh, he says, and, he's, and I was expecting his phone call. I was told he was probably going to call me. And uh, he says, well, Brother Hill, he says, uh, uh, I want to talk to you. I'm fine, go ahead. He says, we have some disagreements. I said, Brother Jamerson, we probably disagree on a whole lot less than what you think. Oh, really? And he starts down the list. And he's, and, and by the way, don't ask me what I think. I'll be glad to tell you. And he did, and I did. He asked me what I thought, and I told him in great detail, excruciatingly so, book, chapter, and verse form. And he just bang, 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 bang. Finally, he starts slowing down. He says, well, I guess you're right. And I said, Frank, the only thing you and I really disagree on of any content, now it gets back to authority also, as we talked about earlier. I said, but the only thing, the thing that separates us is you don't believe we can use the church treasury to feed the poor and hungry. And I said, I believe we can. And I told him, I said, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. But don't keep us from doing what we're supposed to do. And there's the problem there. It just gets back to authority. 
What does the Bible authorize us to do? And, and, and what confuses me is they're so confused about it all. Widows and orphans have their needs met. Mission effort. Here's one. How many missionaries we have? Those, I don't talk about just going over for six weeks. I'm talking about being arrested. How many missionaries this morning? One. I know a couple of you have mentioned Some of you have gone. You, did you do it for free? Oh, Brother Chumley back there, you're not a missionary. <laughs> I love Brother Ken. He's, he's a good man. He's, he's not near the preacher he used to be. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. But it takes money to do that. It takes money to do mission work. Well, now here's a question I have for our elders. That's not maybe not the brethren here, but those that listen to this or read it later on or whatever. Why is it that we make the men that that desire nothing more than in life to go do mission work? Why do we make them crawl down the aisle and beg for money? Now, I've often thought about this. If I were an elder of a congregation, we wouldn't get rid of a preacher. We wouldn't fire him. We'd just say, we're going to, say, Brother Brown, we're going to continue your current pay. Matter of fact, we're going to give you a 10% raise. We're going to send you over to, and we find a desolate spot, and we're going to pay you to be our, our, our evangelist and missionary over there. And we give him the option of whipping all the dogs and walking away. Now, why don't we find a mission field find a suitable man, go to him and solicit his interest in going and being our man on the field over there. We don't have to go solicit money. He doesn't have to spend $7,000 to come back here from Tanzania to go around begging for more money again. Why do we make those brethren do that? That's just beyond me. And we can build buildings, and I'm not, don't misunderstand me. I like air conditioning. I like a padded pew. Don't misunderstand that at all. What I'm saying is, is we've got more money we know what to do with them. Here, every fifth Sunday, some congregations, I'm preaching another lesson now, some congregations say, well, we need to take up a collection because we have a shortfall. And lo and behold, if they don't almost double the contribution from last week. Where's that money been? Did they just oh, look at that, dear? We've got another five hundred dollars or whatever. Where'd that money come? They've had it all along. Why didn't they just average that thing out on the first day of the week as they're supposed to do and give it as they ought to? I just wonder if anybody exp expressed the repentance over that thing. But that's just my opinion. Now you take it for what you want. The unity of the church is sealed at times. You know, when somebody shows up with a bag full of money and you're in dire straits, you just have a little bit of affection for them, don't you? And that's what Paul was doing in Romans chapter 15. He was trying to heal the rift that had started. We have the account of in Galatians chapter 2. But then we come to Christian giving, which I've already touched on, stomped all over, I guess. The spiritual importance of giving as prospered and how spiritual growth occurs. You know, when you give your money to something, you have a concern for it. When you show up and get, when you go buy a brand new car, aren't you concerned about that car? When you send your children off to college, some of us at any rate are concerned about it. We're concerned about what they're going to, we're concerned about what we're buying. I've often thought that if I were sitting in some of these classes today and one of these professors popped off with something, I'd raise my hand. I'd ask a question. And I'd beg him to kick me out of class because then I'd say, listen, I'm buying a product. You're selling me something. I want my money's worth and you've been cheating me. Just my opinion. Take it for what you want. Anyway, show me your checkbook register, which also would include your credit card receipts, and I will show you what you value the most or where your heart truly resides. I don't care what you tell me. Let me see your checkbook. We'll find out what you really think is valuable. We hope you wouldn't be embarrassed in the process. And I don't begrudge somebody a brand new bass boat. I don't begrudge somebody the four-door, four-wheel pickup truck to drive that. $41,000 for some of those trucks. Woo. I don't be, If you've got the money, God bless you because he surely has. I'm saying, have you taken the Lord into account? Have you taken, you know, when somebody works hard, they deserve to be able to retire. I mean, it just, that just comes with the process. That's why we do what we do. But brethren, do we leave the Lord out? What if the elders came to you and sat you down and said, we know that you pulled up at a brand new pickup truck. And then we also talked to Treasure and we found out what you've been getting. We've got a question just right here. And, I, and you know what's going to happen? I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Brother Jack, if you're still here. Where, where'd you go, Brother Jack? I'll tell you what would happen. It's not your business what I get. 
That's probably what you'd get. And that's when the bishops ought to come in and say, yes, it is, because we're watching for your soul. And we're concerned about you going to hell. Let me ask you another question. Here's one that I ask the brethren when I preach on things they don't like. Frequently. <laughs> How do you sneak up on somebody with their hair on fire and tell them their hair's on fire? Do you just kind of, excuse me, Brother Green, but what little hair you have left is on fire. Did you know that? <laughs> or, or would you, now I, I know, I've known Brother Green for years. He was one of my elders when we were up in, in Pennsylvania. And I, if, if I recognize, well, even if I didn't recognize him, I'd still tackle him and throw my coat over him and rolling around and put the fire out. Now he might be fighting me saying, what are you doing that for? Trying to save your life. Now, brethren, when somebody comes to you, one of your pastors comes to you and says, listen, we're concerned about your soul. Why do we object to it? Because the light has been shined on our evil practices and we don't like it. Follow the money. What do you like? Let me see your checkbook and I'll tell you what you like. Jesus tells us that God will provide for us the things of which we are in need. We need certain, we need, we need money to buy food, we need clothes, we need housing. We need those kind of things. Some of us need even health insurance. You know, it's a shame. Why would Brother Ken have to have to live like he's living? Because because there's not enough money to help him get what he needs. You know, and there's other brethren that have that have been in dire straits. And, and recently, some of the email lists, um, I believe Sister Meter even needs some help, and it was it was given to her because of sin. God has created the world in such a way that man can gather his daily needs. You know, the rain falls and just, Matthew 5, 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun, his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Do you realize this world is, is constructed in such a way that we can go make a living? And make a good living if we want to work hard enough. Hard enough. We have been commanded to work in constructive employment in order to supply our personal needs. Uh, Adam was told, you're going to have to start grubbing the dirt, bud. You, you go put yourself in the bind you're in, and now you're going to have to work for it. Ephesians 4 and verse 28, Let him that stole steal mo no more, but rather work, let him work that which is honest with his own hands, that he may uh, supply it and, and give to those that are in need. That's what we do. Now, we don't support them in their laziness. We make them work. We have obligations in addition to our personal ones and that of assisting our neighbors. We must take care of our own needs and family. I'll tell you what, I'm going to, take, I'm going to see my wife is taken care of before I worry about, you, about your wife. But when I get my, my family responsibilities taken care of, we'll help you out. Or we might scale back a little bit to help you out. But we'll help you. Then the, then the brethren and all others as opportunity and resources permit. And notice this. The Bible does not condemn prosperity or the accumulation of wealth. It does not condemn that. I could, if it does, somebody help me out. And I guarantee you somebody will if I've got it wrong. It results from the blessings of the earth created for the benefit of man in the first place. This world is constructed that way. It results from our own labor. How hard are you going to get out there and work? How, how long are you? I've worked 14, 15, 16 hour days before. I've, I've been so tired coming to, you know, I got out of preaching for a while, made a dumb mistake, and, and, and was working. I, I probably never worked that hard in my life, and my wife tried to talk to me when I came home from work, and I'd be falling asleep. Uh, just that tired. But you know, you, you, you do what you got to do. Uh, uh, recall John the Immerser's admonitions to the people that came to him. Well, what are we supposed to do? And he even told the soldiers, he said, listen, uh, you know, stop waylaying people. Take your own, uh, your own wages and, and, and stop extorting people. Live on honest, you know, live soldierly and honestly. The rich farmer, notice this, in Luke 12, the rich farmer was not condemned for building greater storage facilities for his bumper crop. Rather, he was condemned for not taking God in his plans. And brethren, we stand condemned when we do the same thing. This man was, well, look, go back and read that. He just says, thou fool, tonight thou shalt also be required of this. Because, not because he was trying to take care of what he had, because he was going to eat, drink, and be merry, and let everybody else do whatever they were going to do. Paul admonishes us how to deal with wealth. He'll be ready to communicate. Nothing wrong with being wealthy, but when there's a need arises, man, get that checkbook out and be, be the first one in line. And be the first one in line with a big one. And don't be, don't be, I tell you what, Lord, when he, Lord, you know what strikes me is that when the Lord finds out you're willing to give back and generously, I don't think he's going to let, let the, the cow run dry to you. He's going to make sure it's, it's, it's available all the time. The apostle has given guidance on the use of personal talents and abilities. Romans chapter 12 with a main idea being that of faithfulness and consistency to the gospel. The same principle ought to apply to the use of wealth. 
God bless you for having it. Now, what are you doing with it? Here's a question. How does one decide what is excess, and how does one get to be the decider? All oh, these the money that all these uh, executives are making, and all these the, these big companies, uh, uh, that's just excess. Well, who said? Who said what's excess? No, I think it's a little bit high. I'd be willing to apply for an assistant. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, they've worked hard for it, and if you want something, you got to pay. You got to pay to get it, and that's what they're doing. The Gospel of Christ has the answers to both of these questions that we're going to see below as we go along. How should we think and behave towards material possessions? We are to work as if the Lord were our employer, knowing that he sees all and rewards according to work. Now there's a scary thought for you. You're going to get what's coming to you, unless the grace comes in. We are admonished to be energetic in all that we do, whatsoever the hand findeth, Ecclesiastes 9.10. John the Immerser again gave specific instructions on wealth and how to handle it. Back in uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 7, Paul admonishes us as to our attitude towards our wealth, as that of contentment. Whatever amount of wealth you have, you realize, here's something that, that's interesting to me, and I've heard it in a number of different places about our own country. Even the poorest among us, the poorest among us, if they were to pick up with all of their resources, lock, stock, and barrel, and move to Europe, they'd be in the middle class. The poorest among us has widescreen television sets. They've got cell phones. They have nice cars. Color, they, they have microwave ovens. And just on and on and on and on and on, simply because of being in America. I, I understand one missionary over in Africa asked uh, uh, one, one of the local African brethren why he wanted to come to America so much. He said, for the chance to be fat. Now, we laugh about that, and when you think about it, when you hear it, it is humorous, but you think about it. You look, next time you get a chance to see Africans, Native Africans, at home, look at those people. Look at people that are not living in America. Look at them. Now, we might need to talk about being fat, but that's another sermon. How ought we to use our wealth? There are legitimate personal needs. We've already talked about that. Listen, it's going to regrind the same territory. Um, let's see. Oh, let's just move on. Unscriptural methods of raising church funds and how such efforts have infiltrated and affected the church. Talked about the law of exclusion earlier in an earlier lesson somebody did. It teaches us, the law of exclusion teaches us that when God specifies what he desires, all other things are excluded. The tribe of Levi was chosen for service regarding, regarding all things to the tent of the tabernacle and then to the temple, thus eliminating all elders. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, that's the argument that the Hebrew writer makes there about Jesus. He couldn't be a priest here on earth. He had to go to heaven to be a priest. Because only the tribe of Levi was authorized to be uh, an attendant on the temple, a priest. By naming gopher, uh, gopher wood for the ark, Noah was prevented from using any other sort of wood. Well, wait a minute. God didn't say he couldn't use anything else. That's right, he didn't. You know, an example of the way I illustrate this, if I were to... To, when my son was still living at home, and I said, Justin, here's five dollars. Go to the grocery store and get me a 20-ounce loaf of white bread. And let's just say for the sake of discussion, it cost a dollar. And he came back, and I said, where's my change? He said, well, I, I got you your loaf of white bread, but I also got me some other things and took up the rest of it. And if I punished him, would I be justified? The answer is yes. He said, but Dad, you didn't say I couldn't. I said, Justin, I told you what to buy. And I never had that problem with him. Or, or if I sent him for a loaf of white bread, 20-ounce loaf of white bread for a dollar, and he came back with a 20-ounce loaf of pumpernickel for a dollar. Well, Dad, they were out of white bread. Yeah, but I said white bread. And I can't use white bread for this recipe or whatever. And he gave me pumpernickel. Can't use it. He didn't do what I authorized him to do. What I, told, I told him specifically to do this. Now, why do we have a hard time understanding that when it comes to things about worship and how we ought to behave as children of God? What has, uh, what has God said about raising funds for the work of the church? Now, what did he say? And, you know, again, it's just not that complicated. And this is why I get so confused by some of our brethren and some of the silly things they come up with. Now concerning the collection for the saints. As I have uh, given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Well, he never said we couldn't have a raffle. Right, he did. But what did he say to do? 
Now there's some other principles involved here about and we're gonna we're gonna cover them and every time David squirms over there, I'm thinking he's coming forward. We are to lay by in stores, we've been prospered each week. Um, thus all other methods methods of fundraising to carry out the work of the church is therefore rendered unscriptural and an illegitimate illegitimate activity in which a church is to engage. Now how do they do that? Let me give you some examples. By gambling. Now gambling is the act of risking what is yours in order to get what belongs to another with nothing given in return. Another uh, gentleman has said by the term gamble, we mean any activity where a person uses the, their money, the money of which God made him a steward, in order to gain money where the gain of one results from the loss of others. That's gambling. Such events as raffles, bingo. Bingo? Absolutely. Bingo is gambling. Card parties. Do you realize that even playing marbles is gambling? Now, I haven't seen anybody play marbles in years since I was a kid back in the 50s. I, I haven't seen it since then. But gambling, marbles, shooting marbles is gambling. Now, how can that be? Because you're giving, trying to get something from somebody else and not give them anything in return. Um, but, uh, uh, but gambling is a, is a sinful activity regardless of the good that may be done as a result of the money gained. But some attempt to justify such activities by saying that any profit supports some good effort or another which is merely to claim that the ends justify the means. You know, if I, if I win the lottery, I guess I'll be glad to give the Lord 15%. My, I mean, it might even go as high as 20%. Now, I don't buy raffle tickets because they're, it's gambling. And the other problem I have is I'd probably be the only stooge that won that day. Then how would I explain that? to the? I found the ticket on the ground. Now, fellas... <laughs> Listen, a fella in Tampa did that a number of years ago. He was a preacher, as I understand. He said, no, I found the ticket on the ground. I was walking home from the church building one day, going back to the house. We lived within walking distance, and I saw one blowing past. I almost bent down to pick it up. I said, no, it's probably a winner. <laughs> and I, how am I going to do this? Well, you know, <laughs> some have used carnivals, bake sales, car washes, selling tickets to, to meals of various kinds. Brethren, if we want to send our children on a mission work, let's just simply give them the money to do it. You know, let's not have them out there with a car wash. That's not how we do these things. Some religious leaders have even resorted to claiming that God told it. One fellow told, said, if, if a certain amount of money was not given by a specific date, then he would be called home. I seriously thought about writing him a ticket, a check, and then stopping payment on it to see if he'd hold true on it. <laughs> But, you know, God blessed me with Jerry Booker. And, and she said, don't you dare. Uh, others, have, others have sold prayer cloths, holy oil, oil, holy water, and just about... I even received a piece of mail, a paper in the mail one time. It, was just a, it wasn't even an expensive piece of paper. If you'll send me a donation, you'll get blessed. I'll offer a special prayer and bless this. I'll tell you what. I'm easy, but I'm not that easy. All right. Uh, let's just press on. My time is coming to an end. Uh, all right. Simple solution. And it's really nothing more than you've already heard. We must have a working knowledge of what the Bible text actually says. In other words, we have a plan to read the Bible through at least once each year. You have a, just, I don't talk about study. I'm talking about just simply sitting and reading the Bible. Here's a simple plan. Five pages a day. Sit down and just read five pages a day. You realize, you realize how quick, just take a page of your Bible, divide it by five, and you'd be surprised how quick you can read through the Bible. If you want to get done quicker, just double it up. We need to have a program plan of actual personal Bible study. Now that I've read it, I wonder what he meant by that. That's when you get into Bible study and find out what he meant by that. Each congregation ought to begin its own preacher training school ensuring that all of its young boys begin training for service to the congregation. Rather than listen, I'm going to tell you something, and, I, and the people who are listening, I hope, get this, get this and make I want to make it about as clear as I can possibly make it. It was mentioned a while ago that I went to Florida School of Preaching. I couldn't go there today. If a young man came to me and said, Brother Gene, I want to, go, I want to be a preacher. I don't know what to tell you, son. And that's a shame. That's a shame. I sat at their feet. I know what they taught. When it came to, to issues of division, I, Brother Brown, I know what they taught. I was there. I've got it in my notes. I know what they taught. The men involved with that school today, I know what they taught. 
and they don't have the courage and conviction to stand up and say, that's what we taught, and we were, and we were right then and wrong now. And that's just the way of it. And, I, and it hurts me to say that because I consider them my friends. All right. Calm down. <laughs> Likewise, the young girls ought to be trained for their rightful place for service in a local congregation. You know, uh, our young girls are going to grow up to be preacher's wives one day, I hope. And I'll tell you what. Yeah, church secretary, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you this, and I'm sure Sister Hill and Sister McClish would, uh, would be able to amen this, but you couldn't pay me enough to be a preacher's wife. There's just not that much money. Okay. You can say anything you want to to me, but don't get on my wife, brethren. Men should be reproved, rebuked, and exhorted to take up their responsibilities as men in the local congregation. Brethren, we are told to quit ourselves like men. That means, you know, I'll tell you one reason why men don't want to be elders, and I'm sympathetic towards this. They'd have to be pastors over me. You think about that. Think about any given congregation. Why don't congregations, more congregations have elders? It'd be like herding cats. And, 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 and I'll tell you what, now we laugh when we say that, but it really is not funny. Sit in a business meeting. Sit in a business meeting and try to get a decision made. Real quick, I'm going to finish up. Tried out a congregation a number of years ago up in the Kansas City area. Now, this is a couple years ago when things were still going pretty good. And the brother we were staying with said, you know, we wanted to use house to house heart to heart. Now there's some fellowship issues. He said, well, one man in the congregation won't let us do it. And I thought, what? Okay. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, and he said he objects to the cartoons they use. I said, cartoons? Yeah, and I said, what do we do? And I said, here's what you do. Robert's Rules of Order say that a motion is made, a motion is then seconded, assuming it's going to be seconded. Then you say, discussion. You have your discussion. Somebody moves the question, and you have a vote on yes, yes or no, up or down. Assuming it's scriptural, you either go with that or something else. I said, what you do is you get in there and you discuss that thing again. Somebody makes a motion, we, we, we go ahead and, and use that for a particular program. And, and everybody gets their opportunity, you have a second, everybody gets their opportunity to discuss, and then somebody says, I move the question. Then you vote. And he said, well, what about this one fellow objecting? I said, you going to let him be the doctor, please? You going to let him be the ramrod? Is he the only vote that you need? Well, we had grilled the preacher session after dinner on the grounds, and I opened it up to questions to the brethren in the congregation. And somebody, and he, he raised it, he raised his hand. The fellow objected, raised his hand, said, what if somebody objects to a program? I say, well, it's something that's it's scriptural and, and so forth. And I said, you let everybody have their say, and then you have a vote. And the eyes carry it, assuming it's scriptural. Well, what if somebody objects? He had his chance. But what if somebody objects? I said, too bad, so sad. That's exactly what I said. Thank you, brethren. Well, that's an example of uh, her 